1 Corinthians chapter 13. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Last week, we looked at a famous passage when Jesus said that he is the vine, we're the branches, that God, who is our Father, is the vine dresser, and it's Him who wants to grow and uh, wants us to abide in Jesus so that we can abound in bearing much fruit. He wants a lot of fruit from your life and mine. It's like God has invested everything in you and me. If ever you're wondering how much God loves you, He paid the ultimate price for you. He sent His only Son into the world to live for us, live among us, die for our sins, and then be resurrected to everlasting life so that we can be connected back into the love of God forever. We, we, without that, uh, Jesus says, if, you'd, if we're not connected, if we don't abide in the vine, if we don't connect to him, we're not going to bear any fruit. He says, actually, apart from him, you can do nothing. I just, I just cut this off uh, a tree in my garden. And as you can see, nothing's making that pear just happen. It didn't just happen. The only reason it, it's growing, the only reason it, it's been able to get to this point is because it is vitally connected in to the rest of the tree. In the same way, Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. You know, from now on, this is great, but from now on, this branch isn't going to produce anything. It won't produce anything apart from being connected. And that's the same in every area of our lives, and especially with regard to spiritual things. That's why it so matters that we get connected to Jesus. Don't people talk about the love of God and, and how I, oh yes, well, I believe in God and all of that, but actually Jesus is the connection. Jesus is the vine, and we become a branch that gets connected to Jesus. And from that is where we, the, 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 the life of God, the divine power of God, flows in and enables us to be everything that we couldn't be by ourselves and do everything that we couldn't do by ourselves. In the book of Galatians, the Apostle Paul wrote a letter to a church that was trying its hardest in order to be able to be good and to, to please God even by what they were doing, by religion. We're looking at this in our grow groups at the moment and I, I really urge you to sign up and join a grow group and to be able to get connected in that way with other believers. These people were trying their best, but, but actually Jesus, uh, Paul writes to them and says, you didn't come into this relationship with God by your own merits, by your own hard work, by you trying. 
You actually came in by grace, by love, by, by Jesus just reaching out and finding you and bringing you to know the Father. And that's how you've got to continue. You needed grace to get you in. We're going to need grace to be able to get us to, to continue to grow. In fact, a great writer by the name of Dallas Willard said, Christians, believers, actually need, end up burning more grace than non-Christians up here. It's like a fuel. We need more grace, not just to get us into the kingdom of God so that we, we start there, but so that we can grow, so that we can continue to to, to keep on growing in all those different areas of our Christian life. And so in John 15, just to remind you, Jesus said, I'm the true great vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in mine that doesn't bear fruit and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit. Sometimes that's painful to have something cut off that I thought was, was okay. But the reason that he does this is so that he's gonna produce more fruit. And then he says, you, you can't be fruitful without me, without being connected. To, and then he says, remain in me. We looked at that last week, abide in me, remain in me, it says in the New Living Translation. And then later on he says, he says, when you, when you produce much fruit, that's gonna give great glory to my Father. That's what he wants for you and for me, to have, a, have this life that produces in every season. He wants us to be fruitful, to be fruity, in every season of our lives, no matter what's going on. This isn't just like, like now this is getting ready and this is getting ripe. The way that this happens, whatever season it is in the natural, God wants you and me to supernaturally be fruitful in every season and he wants to grow the fruit of the spirit. Again, that's listed in Galatians. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. He wants these things to, to be so evident in our lives that people who are going past see you and me and they see somebody who looks more like Jesus. And this fruit is, is not just, a, it isn't a collection of fruits, by the way. It's a singular fruit. The fruit of the Spirit is singular, but it tastes different. So people come up to it and they go and they taste, and they go, oh, that, you taste kind. And you kind of smell good. And, uh, and, and all these different kind of things that we have are meant to be reflections of Jesus, but it's a single fruit of the Holy Spirit that tastes different in these different areas. And it's no good just saying, oh, well, I'm, uh, I, yes, I think I'm more, I'm, I'm kind of growing in self-control, but not in love. Um, because that's just going to end up with some disciplined, kind of nasty person who doesn't get on well with others. This is why it's important this fruit grows out in all these different areas. How does that even work? Well, it works by, by being connected, by abiding, as we said, and abounding in Jesus. Jesus said, as he goes on, I'll just carry on the rest of the reading. He says, I've loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. So Jesus is talking about love. And the first fruit of the Holy Spirit, the first fruit, if you like, the first thing that's got to show, we talk about first fruits at Ivy, the first fruit that has to show is love. The Bible says God is love. It never says that, that love is God, but it does say God is love. So Jesus is showing us how it is that we can end up living this life of love. The Bible says over and over again, live a life of love. We said last, year, last week, maybe you could rate yourself on these different fruit areas. How fruity are you in these different areas? Um, scale of one to 10 again, are you growing more and more loving these days? What is it that's, hap that's happening to help you to become more and more a person who loves like God loves you? The Bible says we love because he first loved us. So you've got to get that first love in place. Once I get that first love in place, then I'm able to love other people. The, the greatest commandment, Jesus said, is to love. He says you've got to love God and then love others your neighbour as you love yourself. So there's three kinds of love involved in there. There's, there's a commandment to love God and then to love neighbours and to love me. It's okay to love me. You know why? Because God loves me. That's the reason. The reason I can love me is because with all my faults and failures and all my mess ups is because that's how God loves me and he's never stopped loving me. He's never going to love me any more than he loves me right now. He's never going to love me or you any less than he does right now because his love is eternal and, it, and it, it's unchanging and it's unconditional because of what Jesus has done it's given us a gift of grace for you and me now when we see that word love our culture 
and uh, well, culture throughout history has basically defined love in all kinds of different ways. What do you, what's your next thing? When you read, see that word, love is dot, dot, dot. What's the picture? You know, love is, love is a feeling perhaps for you. Or love is a poem. Or, or love is a particular song, or, or love is a relationship that I have had or, or that I would want and that I haven't got. Love is unattainable, love is out of reach, or, or love is that, that, uh, that first kiss that I had whenever it was. All these different kinds of things, we could end up thinking that love is that. But it all basically boils down to feelings very often. It's like endorphins that get released in, in, and uh, we feel loving towards somebody or even something. And when we do that, our, we become attracted to it and we want it and it becomes our focus and it's what we want. And, and very often that's what, what we think, we just can say, well, love is that. But, but Jesus doesn't say that's what love is. He, he actually goes on to talk about love and he talks about commandments. He says, I've loved you as the Father has loved me. This is carrying on from that same passage about the vine. And then he says, when you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. So we said it was unconditional, but actually this says there is something attached to this idea of love. The way that this thing grows, the way in which it is because it's, being connect, it's connected to and remaining in the love of the Father because of obedience to his commandments. And then he goes on and talks about, it's funny, he goes love, joy, peace, because, because in the fruit of the Spirit, because he says, I've told you these things so that you'll be filled with my joy. So when you've got love, then you're going to get joy and then you're going to get peace and all these other things are going to flow out of getting this first love right. So I've got to say it again, do you know the love of the Father? Do you know that you are actually not a pear? You are the apple of his eye, the Bible says, that you are somebody who... He, who, who God loves so much that he would send his only son into this world to pay the price on the cross, to shed his blood, to be able to wash away every stain, every, every pain, to break every chain of sin in your life so that you could stand before God forgiven and full and whole and loved forever. Not because of anything that you've done, but just simply because I'm loved. And the Bible talks about that as being justification. That's the word that's used for it. And, and somebody said that's like, it's just as if I'd never sinned. It's how I can stand before the Father. And he loves me as his son, or he loves me as his daughter. I'm adopted forever into his family. I have an inheritance, I belong to him. I'm royalty, I'm, 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 I belong to the king, I'm in that family. I'm no longer a slave, I'm not having to be fearful because of all these things that God has done. When, whenever, when I said yes to Jesus, when I said yes to the love of the Father, it's in response to that first love of him already saying yes to me on the cross. Yes, I'll forgive you. Whether you knew what you were doing or not, when you, when you ask me, the, the Father says, because of Jesus Christ, I'll, I'll give you that fresh start and new life. That needs to happen. If you've never had it happen, I urge you, I implore you to spend some time today Search your heart and invite the Holy Spirit of God to come in and show you that yes, we're all sinners, we all fall short of the glory of God, but we can all be forgiven, we can all be justified by the grace of God that comes to us in Jesus Christ. He died and he rose again so that we can live with him and know his love forever and ever and ever. The Bible says it's, it's so that nobody would have to perish. See, apart from him, we're gonna perish. Apart from him, we, we, our life, however short or long it is in this life, won't last. But when we get connected to God, we're connected to a love that will last forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And he'll take our sins, and the Bible says he'll remove them as far as the east is from the west. Just, just however, how far is that? Well, you go east and I'll go west, then we're never going to meet again. Because that's what he does with our sins. The Bible says he takes our sins, hides them behind his back. He does it so he'll, he'll throw them into the sea, never to be remembered anymore. See, that's what I think of when I pray. I don't think about, oh, but I've had, I did this and I did that, or this is happening, or what this person did to me. I just ditch all of that and say, Father, I'm yours. Thank you for loving me. Thank you, Jesus. And then I'm remaining in his love. And then I say, Lord, I also, because I've been loved like that, I want to keep your commandments. I want to remain 
in your love. So would you get me closer and closer to you? Let that, the power of that divine life flow through me. And then I'm going to get that joy that isn't dependent on circumstance that we're going to look at next week. And then Jesus said this, yes, your joy will overflow. This isn't just for me. This is joy that bubbles up and overflows. And then he says, this is my commandment. Love one another in the same way as I have commanded you. See, if love was just a feeling, it could not be a command. But Jesus here, God, commands love. He said, I want you to love other people, just like I've loved you. You've got to have that love in you first to be able to give it away. You've got to have it in you to be able to overflow to other people. But he says, this is my command. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. And then he tells us exactly what that love looks like, because he says, there's no greater love than to lay down one's life for his friends. In other words, true love, real love, is costly. It costs something for, for, for Jesus to love us like that. And it's going to cost me to be able to love other people as well. He says, no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command which shows that actually love is also a conduct. So love isn't just a feeling, although there may be feelings attached to it. According to the Bible, according to God, love is a command and it's costly and it's a conduct. We're going to be breaking those things down one at a time. He says, you're my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you slaves because a slave doesn't confide in his slaves. A master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends since I've told you everything the Father told me. You didn't choose me, I chose you and I appointed you to go and produce fruit. We're back there again. Lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. This is my command. Love one another. This is a command. Love one another. Wow. Well, how does that actually work out in our lives? Um, how, how is it that I can, I can fulfill that command? The way that I do that is by, first of all, I can look at my conduct. I can, I can ask the Lord to grow in me this fruit of the Spirit, which is love, the first fruit of the fruit of the Spirit. In 1 Corinthians, a letter that Paul wrote, the Apostle Paul wrote to a church at Corinth, he says to the people there, brothers and sisters, I would not have you ir uh, ignorant with regard to spiritual gifts, is what it, it says in lots of translations. Maybe you're familiar with that if you've ever heard that verse, but actually the word gifts isn't actually there in the, in the original language in which the Bible was written. He basically says, brothers and sisters, I don't want you to be ignorant about spiritual that's it, about spiritual things. But so often we, the church, even Christian people, can be quite ignorant about spiritual things. And he, he goes on and he talks about, he does talk about spiritual gifts, and he talks about miracles and signs and wonders and amazing things and about the resurrection that only God can do, but he's done it through Jesus Christ. Now that means that therefore we can have confidence that when we die, it's not the end. He talks about all those things and they're like bookmarks, but right in the middle of all of that, he talks about very famously in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, he talks about love. And this is the kind of love that gets commanded because it's the kind of love that can be measured. See, it's like, how much do I love you? People might say, oh, well, tell me how much you love me. When I'm putting the grandkids to bed sometimes, they'll say, let, I'll say to them, let me tell you how much I love you. And it's like, I love you to the moon and back. And I love you to the stars and back. I love you to the, whatever it is. It's like we're trying to measure it in terms of distance. It's really hard to measure love like that. But there, there, there are conducts, there are ways that I can act and demonstrate that actually this love is, is really being worked out in me. I need to understand that although it gets used a lot at weddings, this passage from 1 Corinthians 13 was never intended, he wasn't writing it to people who are getting married, although it applies in a marriage. I can tell you after 30 odd years, I want to grow in this love more and more with Zoe. But he's talking about how we live in community with one another people. 
how even if we have got spiritual gifts from God, we exercise them and how we use them in such a way that they don't just build me up or try and make me look good, but actually they're things that are going to benefit other people and that I don't become proud or arrogant of them or boastful in, in different ways because all those things are the opposite of love. He says, you know, I could, I could, I could have the most incredible prophetic insight. I could have great faith and, and do miracles. But he says, if I haven't got love, it doesn't matter. It, that's not the kind of love that God commands, that Jesus said his friends are, are meant to show in the world. And here's, here's the list. I'm going to go through them. And again, maybe you could rate yourself on these different things. First Corinthians chapter 13 describes some of the conduct of people who demonstrate this kind of love to God. And uh, he says, love is patient. Take a bit of time. <laughs> Rate yourself on patience. Again, I, I sometimes ask people, if you're really brave, to the people who are closest to you, give them the scorecard and say, am I more or less patient these days? Is this something that's, that's growing in me? Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. That's saying some things love is not. There's positives and there's negatives. To the extent that I'm proud and rude and boastful, take a few off your score. It does not demand its own way. It's not irritable. It keeps no record of being wronged. Again, we might have started off and thought, oh yeah, I'm quite good and rated ourselves high. But then these things, and, and we all, we all fall short, don't we? This is why we need Jesus. This is why we need more grace. This is why we need to be connected. This is why this is about abiding in the love of God and receiving the love of God and receiving the grace of God to change us and help us. It does not rejoice about injustice. You know, when, when, when something happens and, um, you know, I, I read some people's Facebook feeds and even Christians, some of the things that get written about, about not caring about asylum seekers or, or people like that. And, and I'm, like, I, I'm like, wow. And then I look at my own life too and how much do I care about the injustice that I see all around me. But love rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, which is good news because God is love. So he never gives up on you and me. Never loses faith. Love is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. And he says, all these miracle gifts, prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge, they'll all fade away. But love lasts forever. This love that God wants to put inside of you and me. Now our knowledge is partial and incomplete. Even the gift of prophecy only re reveals part of the big picture. But when perfection comes, these partial things will become useless. And then later on at the bottom of the passage, he says famously, three things will last forever. Faith, hope and love. But the greatest of these is love. So love is not just a feeling. Love is a command. The fact that I am obeying the command is revealed in the ways in which I'm willing to, to love in these ways. My conduct is, is such that, that I'm willing to pay the price of love. You see, there's always a price of love. I'm not just talking about it costing money to buy flowers or chocolates or something like that. When Jesus spoke about love, remember, he said, there's no greater love than to lay down your life for your friends. And that's exactly what Jesus did for us, for you and for me. If, again, if, if ever you're not sure that you're loved, go to the cross and think about the cross and think about 
what it is that the price that has been paid, the most precious substance in the universe, the blood of Jesus Christ has been shed to purchase you and me and to win us back for God so that nobody will ever be able to say that you don't belong to him because not only did he create you and make you, but he's also paid the full price to redeem you. Great love is greatly uh, expensive. It costs everything. It costs everything for the love of God to come to you and me in ways that we can receive it. That's what love is. There's a, a guy by the name of, uh, we call him Saint Bernard of Clairvaux, and he talked a little bit more about the loves that, uh, that, that we grow in as a Christian. See, the first part is you have to come to know this love. And if you've not done that again, I'm inviting you, we're going to pray at the end. If you've not already done it and say, Lord, I need to know that love that costs you everything but comes to me for free. And then you kind of cross the line of faith and you say, I'm going to, I, want to, I want to grow in my love of, of you. And I'm just going to write something up next which will help us to be able to understand that based upon something by a guy called St. Bernard of Clairvaux and what he wrote about the love of God and how we come to know it. I wanted just to look at this um, kind of deepening picture of what it is to receive and to know the love of God and, and what it means. Because, you know, we can say, we say the prayer once and we said to God, okay, I, I kind of hate my old life, I hate my sin, and I, and I love you and I want to kind of follow you from now on. And, um, and that, that kind of gets us into being born again, that, that new life etc. But how do we grow in this love? How do we do what Jesus said and remain in this love? How do we do it so that that love goes deeper and deeper and that the fruit grows in our lives and we really learn to abide and to abound? And I, and, and I read uh, some years ago this incredible short book by uh, Bernard of Clairvaux who was, um, who, who was given a monastery to look after. He ended up actually kind of planting like a church planter lots of monasteries um, in, in France and, and beyond France into other nations too. So this is this 11th century monk who wrote very influential writings for Christianity um, that, that Martin Luther and other uh, shapers of church history would look back to the things that he wrote uh, and especially his look at this thing called the four loves and how that works. And he talks about love being like degrees that we grow in. And you know what that's like, how you could start out by thinking that you like somebody and then you kind of grow from that liking them and, and, and to, to actually loving them. And, and then there comes a point at which you're like, well, I'd just do anything for this person. And, you know, it, it goes from an acquaintance into something more passionate and and what that looks like. And, and he says that he said, it can be a little bit like that with God in terms of how we, how we grow in, in love. And the first kind of love that we ha might have with God is really when we just, we just love ourselves really um, for, our, for our own sake. There's a, there's a sense even in which even to become a Christian can be kind of selfish because it can be like, I want to be saved from hell. I don't want to be punished for my sins. And I want all the blessings that God has, has given me. And, uh, and he says, this, this kind of love actually can be still quite self-centered. It can be still quite self-focused. It's, it's a kind of natural love to, to love like that. There's not much actually supernatural going on in it. And actually it can even kind of stay, stay around that for a long time. We can end up loving God. We're still not, we maybe we're less focused on ourselves, but when we love God, when we sing to God, when we worship God, it's really still a little bit about me. It's about how God is going to bless me. And I love God because he blesses me. I love God because he gave me this gift or he answered that prayer or he did this for me or he didn't do that. And all those kind of things end up this is like, a, it's a growing love. It's not so selfish, but it's still pretty self-focused because it's all about how God loves me. And because God, because you love me, I, I'm going to love you. It's, this, it's kind of transactional in a sense. And, um, you know, because I love you, God, because you're there when I need you. It's, uh, it's, it's like uh, in Psalm 116, it says, I love the Lord because he's heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. That's a good thing to love God like that. It's not a bad love. It's not a thing, but it, this is, this is it's still a little bit self-focused and many of us can get stuck. Maybe you're stuck in that kind of way in which the worship is still a little bit about me. Next, 
deepening um, love is to love God for God, just for who he is, just for God's sake. As we grow in faith, as we go deeper, as we realise God isn't just there to be a genie who solves all of my problems. And as I abide with him, as I worship him, as I spend time with him, as I spend time reading his word, I get to know more about who God really is. And he's not the God of my imagination, and he's way better than I could ever imagine him to be. Um, in, in, and no matter what's going on, in my life, God is still good. I, I've come to that point, have you come to that point of realising that no matter what, God loves you. No matter what, God is faithful. No matter what, his, his steadfast love endures forever. And, and every morning he's got new mercies and new blessings for us. This is, it starts, I think this can happen only in worship and prayer and in community with other people. We start to see God not just as this personalised, just me and him relationship that's all about me. I start to love God for God alone. You'd think that would be the end of it, but actually Bernard goes on to say that the deepest kind of love is when we love ourselves for the sake of God. What does that mean? Does that mean, if we kind of come full circle, does that mean that now uh, it's all about me again? No, what he's actually saying is, when I focus on this kind of love, when I love myself and, and see that, I can, I can love me because I am forgiven. I can love me because I am a son of God. I can love me because I'm a, you're a daughter or a son of the king and I see myself as he sees me. And so I can love myself because God says it's okay for me to love me. And when I get that kind of love, that starts to change the world because that kind of love changes me. And then I want other people to experience that love too. Again, we love because he first loved us. The, the, in Romans, the Apostle Paul talks about the, the love of Christ. The, it compels us, it drives us to be able to tell other people about him, to introduce and share his love to them as well, so that it goes way beyond me and wraps its arms around the whole world. I love the, uh, the words of 1 John chapter 4 it says this, and so we know and rely on the love that God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God lives in us. See, we, we can often have the, the end a bit about God is love, but, but do you rely on the love of God? Do you know his love for you is reliable and unchanging? When I get that growing in me, that no matter what, this isn't about my performance, this isn't about whether or not he performed and did what I asked of him, it's just a settled issue. When I woke up this morning, I woke up in the universe where the, the God who created the universe said, I love you. When, no matter what you're going to go through or what, what questions will be answered or won't be answered this, this week, here's what we need to know. This is what you need to know. You are loved with an everlasting love. That there's nothing in the whole of creation that can ever separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. If you don't already know that love, you need that transforming love in your life. And then if you do know it, ask him. Let's pray and, and, and talk with one another about how we can grow in this love, this love relationship with our God so that we can rely on the love that God has got for us. And then I can truly love me as he truly loves me. And then I can truly love others who, who also are loved by him.